I wanted to start with where we left off last time, just you know, to refresh our memories about weathering, and also um, let me just say at the outset, I'm. I changed my mind about whether to do physical or chemical weathering first, and we're going to do physical weathering first, like it is in the book. Um, this seemed to make more sense that way when I thought about it. I don't know. We'll see. Um, all right. I wanted to just start off reminding ourselves of some of the changes that occur in this process of weathering. And uh, starting by looking at you know obvious changes in color and texture, um, but I want to go ahead and quick cut to some uh, some graphs that will show oops, that show us quantitatively some of these some of the changes that some of which we can see with our eyes, right? That that. Um, See these white dots are bulk density, so here we have depth. Um, and these scales are a bit different. This is a core in rock, and this is in soil up here, just for 1.4 meters here. And then this goes down to 36 meters depth in, in a rock core. Um, and so the, the white dots are the bulk density. And as we get into the weathered rock, we see that varying some, and then decreasing quite a bit as we get up into the satellite and the soil. Um, where the green density changes a bit, but not all that much, especially, or at least not until we get up into the upper parts of the soil. The porosity, well, we can see that, that why, this is trying to, we're trying to get at, well, why is the bulk density changing? It's not so much because the grain density is, change, is changing, it's because the porosity is changing. The pores are getting bigger. So this porosity is simply a measure of the fraction of the bulk volume that is, say, airspace, rather, whoops, <laughs> rather than um, rather than solid. So the porosity can be filled with water or air, um, and we can see that the the increases in porosity mirror the decreases in the bulk density. Uh, this is a measure of the strain. So this is simply, you know, does anybody remember how I defined strain? It's simply a, a fraction of deformation. So a strain of two would mean that the stuff has, in this type of measure, that the material has doubled in size. Um, and they're measuring this with respect to the number of zircons uh, because zircons don't weather. So if you start with the, how much zircon is in the parent rock and then you look at this, the concentration of zircons in the, weathered so in the weathered rock in the soil and so on, you can measure how much that material is dilated or compressed. And you can see that maybe there's a bit of noise here, maybe even a bit of compression, but overall, as you get into the soil, the mobile regolith, you get that dilation, that change in volume. You know, critters stirring up the soil, critters and plants overturning the soil, uh, making it much more porous. Um, but there are some more curious changes uh, you know, those ones that we just looked at, those are pretty intuitive. We kind of know that that happens to, to rock as it weathers into soil. These are a bit more curious, and this is looking at a, at a smaller scale, just at a core into a piece <coughs> of granite. Um, and looking at, on the one hand, down here, the tensile strength in that rock, as you get from the core of the rock in the interior up to the exterior rindlets, like we talked about last time, and how the um, you've got, say, a tensile strength of 10 megapascals in here, uh, and then it's just dropping as you get out into the weathered rock. Uh, but curiously, here's this VP here is seismic velocity. So seismic velocity is 
typically going to favor sort of tight rock, uh, crystalline rock. Um, we see the seismic velocity within the interior of the rock pretty constant. Um, maybe a bit of a drop at the exterior of what we're calling the gray core of the rock here, but then a jump up when we get into this discolored brown bend in the exterior of this particular granite. And then when we get out into the Rhinelets, it drops that back down where we have a low seismic velocity. So this is a bit curious. Um, and this is a case where we do have these Rhinelets. We have the onion skin weathering, so this will be sort of a, a clue for us uh, going forward. There are other changes that we can look at, but I want to kind of keep ourselves to the the physical side at this point, because um, we got to do a little math to, to learn what the chemical change, how to how to track the chemical changes. We're going to have to introduce some, some a, a little bit of math to explain that, which I don't want to do right now. So it just brings us to what you know this question of okay, so how does our agent of weathering break the rock? Um, that's where we really want to start. We see that the, the changes that are happening are starting at the rock, and so we want to know, well, okay, first of all, how do we break that rock? Um, we could use a hammer. Uh, I, this graduate student has the biggest, the most amazing sledgehammer swing I've ever seen. Um, you know, most people sort of do this, like this guy, like, um, uh, we could use a saw. Uh, but these are sort of unlikely uh, mechanisms for doing, you know, making rhinelets, um, for shattering rock like that. Although it almost looks like it was beaten up with a hammer. Um, but uh, doing things like that, probably not. Um, or like this. This is actually on Timber Hill. This is a big granite, not granite, big basalt boulder. Um, and you can see here that this piece of wood was burning. And we've got bits of the rock exterior flaked off. Um, there's a closer view of it. We got some really <coughs> excuse me, curious looking stuff like this. Um, this is called the windows on the Faria River. Um, and then your good old arch formation like this in the Navajo sandstone. Um, that's need for scale. Um, and then, you know, these sorts of exfoliation sheets. Um, there's a canoe for scale, although the bluff is still quite a ways in the distance. Um, but you can see these exfoliation sheets in this uh, massive layer there. Um, and here's uh, some exfoliation sheets on El Capitan showing specific sites of recent failure. And you get some really curious things like this, uh, these tent blisters um, in Texas. Um, where these things are like, I don't know, I want to say they're like a meter thick. They're pretty thick. Um, so let's just say that um, whereas, you know, let's write up on the board, or I'm going to write up on the board, um, we might be able to make reasonable guesses about, um, or you might be able to make reasonable guesses about what some of our geomorphic agents are in weathering. But, um, but the, uh, the mechanisms they employ are far enough from our everyday understanding that I won't try to pull you on those. They're, they're, um, I mean, you know, unless we have a ringer in the room or so, um, I doubt you're going to guess some of these mechanisms, partly because most of the books are, seem to not get it right either. Um, you know, these are, these are mysterious things happening in the rock. 
Um, all right, so we've got our agents. Let's uh, bring back our friend here. And um, so our agents of erosion, or agents of weathering, I mean, um, and over here, I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and, you know, what are the mechanisms they're going to be employing? And I can run through some of them, and they, these will probably not be too awfully surprising to you. Like I said, I, okay, let's, let me just rattle them off. Heat, um, water, and I'm going to very carefully write that just as H2O because uh, uh, I don't want to imply that it's one phase or another. Um, solutes slash salts, um, again, maybe implying a phase change here, um, biota, and I'm also going to sort of pair that with wind, those seem to act together. Um, And then down here, I'm just going to put planet. And um, you'll kind of see what I mean when I get over to the mechanism side. Um, so in terms of heat, the mechanism that we're, we're dealing with is thermal stress, or even sometimes uh, in some cases, termed thermal shock. Um, and this, this essentially has to do with uh, differential expansion. The water employs a mechanism that we'll call heave pressure. Something I hope that we'll that I'll get a chance to explain in some detail to you because it's pretty kind of wicked cool, um, but not intuitive in at all unless you built an intuition regarding it over many years, I suppose. Um, for this one, solutes and salts. We're talking about the pressure of crystallization. Okay, so the heat pressure up here, that involves a phase change. And this one, involves precipitation of a solute. What about the biota and the wind? Well, I don't know. Um, the wind in us, here we're, we're talking wind blowing against trees, trees are rooted into rock. Um, the, the, the roots themselves can actually exert some pressure uh, due to something called the turgor pressure. And I may be mispronouncing that if you're an expert and uh, mis I'm butchering that, then please let me know. But um, this, is, this is simply the pressure that the um, this is essentially due to water uptake, you know, that, that it, um, it can pull in water and, and exert enough pressure on the outside of the root to, to expand it slightly. Um, and you know, whether that alone is enough to crack rock, 
Uh, maybe it's at least enough to anchor the root in the rock so that when the wind blows, it can pull on, so it can pull on the rock. Um, when I talk about the planet, I'm really just talking about tectonic or structural stresses. And also just gravity, such as when you're on a cliff face. Um, our materials, I, I was going to write them up, but probably shouldn't even bother. I mean, we're just talking rock, and we're talking that tensile strength of the rock. Um, Maybe the compressive strength might come into play now and again, but, but generally not so much. Um, leave a little space here, because I'm going to want to put some values on, on these stresses. But um, if we're talking about rock, and it's Write this out, unit axial compressive strength, or UCS in megapascals. And then we've also got the unit axial uh, tensile strength. So, um, you know, we can look at the different rocks like granite, limestone, marble. This is just out of uh, a couple of papers in the literature. This is not supposed to be any kind of exhaustive list of rocks. Um, but we get compressive strength, say, for granite on the order of like, you know, something like 200 to 230 megapascals. Um, limestone, something like 50. Marble, bigger range, 30 to 140. And the sandstone, also a relatively large range, 60 to 130. But the tensile strengths are quite a bit lower. For granite, say 13 megapascals. Limestone three to four, uh, marble five to eight, and sandstone three to seven. So, like, you know, that's why we, you know, concrete is a is a man-made uh, conglomerate, and we reinforce it with steel because it has great compressive strength, similar to rock, but really poor tensile strength. Um, similar again to rock. So now some people who talk about rock fracture will will simply say, you know, tensile strength is so low. I mean, this is in all of these cases you're talking about intact rock strength. You're not talking about rock that has joints in it already, um, and a lot of rock is already jointed. But um, but it is useful to think about, okay, well, how, how might some of those joints occur in rock that's not already cracked? So let's, I want to throw up some values of some of these potential stress stresses here um, so we can get an idea for whether they might be sufficient to deal with these tensile strengths in the rock. So the thermal stress, um, we can get like up to about 40 megapascals um, or heat pressure um, we can get up to around maybe 10 megapascals uh, pressure of crystallization come up with a number around 20 megapascals Turner pressure, pretty small. That's only going to be down around one megapascal. 
Um, the um, tectonic structural stress, that's just sort of maybe a regional stress due to, um, you know, literally tectonic shortening. Um, can't really personally put a number on that. Um, but gravity, we can do, we can reasonably say that um, that's going to be, say, 25 kilopascals per meter of rock. That is over, say, overburden pressure, um, but also say if we're on a cliff face, uh, what's the what's the pressure of the over of the rock above us on a cliff? Okay, so uh, all but the turgor pressure are you know, plenty sufficient to deal with these sorts of pencil strengths that we've got up there. Um, and so now we just need to, you know, you now I could just stop there, but that wouldn't be any fun now, would it? So, um, personally, if I were you, I'd want to know, well, what the heck? Like, how can I generate, and what are we talking about? with like heat pressure and pressure crystallization. I mean, those are something that I'm familiar with in my everyday life. Um, thermal stress, I can kind of, kind of understand if I've, you know, taken a glass dish from the oven and, do, and put it in under cold water and shattered it, right? Um, but, uh, and I can understand that roots stick in rock, you know, maybe try to pull roots out of cracks in rock. And, um, and I can understand the, the weight of rock on my shoulders, maybe. Um, but some of these others are, are not intuitive in the least. So, let's... Let's go through some of this. So I'm going to start with one that is relatively, I think, relatively easy to understand. Um, and that is spallation. And this will also introduce a concept that, um, that will prove useful to us uh, for talking about frost cracking. Um, so, spallation is generally simply the, uh, the heat, usually of fire, and that thermal stress. Um, I'm just going to quick write up um, some process terminology. I am going to start with spallation, but let me just sketch up some of these. Um, we're going to talk about spallation. We're going to talk about frost cracking. That's what we call uh, when we've got freezing water. and heave pressure. Um, we've got this thing called salt cracking. Which is the precipitation of solutes And that 
pressure crystallization. Root damage. So root damage, where we're talking about, you know, maybe employing that turner pressure of the trees and water and wind, uh, plus the turner pressure. Um, sheet or exfoliation jointing. Which is going to be due to earth pressures and gravity. Now, you might ask, because I asked you to ask last time, where does onion skin weathering fit into all of this? Um, and if you'll just forgive me a bit, I'll just kind of hold back on where that fits into all this for now. Um, because I, what I want us to do is consider some of these processes and how they work and what could be responsible for the onion skin type weathering that we see a lot of, in a lot of places. Um, so yes, yeah, so we'll start again with spallation. This is when we rapidly heat a rock exterior while the interior is insulated. So this is, we have thermal expansion, or we have heat, <laughs> say, which leads to thermal expansion. which leads to strain, which leads to stress. The thermal expansion, strain, that is, we're, we're deforming the rock at the outside of it. And eventually, that, that the stress built up by that deformation causes the rock to pop. Uh, sometimes, literally, like spallation, you know, it is a relatively quick sort of thing. A fire might move through in half an hour and then the outsides of the boulder might just pop off. Um, in order to, now there is a formula for this stress in the book, um, but I'm less interested in that. I mean, you can look that up. Um, but let's just, let's just take as a given that, that we can generate a sufficient stress. Um, and concern ourselves more with what sorts of thicknesses of spalls might this thermal shock generate. And to do that, I need to introduce um, some new terms and concepts. I need to introduce the idea of thermal diffusion. which anybody who's done any cooking is somewhat familiar with. You know, if I'm cooking a grilled cheese sandwich, it, there's that fine art of, you know, okay, getting that heat to where I just get the butter scorched enough and to not burn by the time the heat spreads and melts the cheese. Um, and So I'm going to have the, the, the heat the exterior of the rock, that heat diffuses into it, and the depth of significant temperature change depends on, so the depth of change, the significant change, and this is, I'm not going to write significant, but remember significant, um, is dependent on the thermal diffusivity. There's a big word that we'll see again, diffusivity. That's essentially a material property that's describing how good a conductor, I mean, it's, it's related to thermal conductivity, but it doesn't have the same units. 
um, but it, like conductivity, it will increase for, it's larger for things like copper than it is for things like rock. Um, and it also depends on, on the time that we spend heating the rock. And specifically, the formula is delta, so this is delta, in case you're unfamiliar with lowercase Greek. And we've got a square root sign, and thermal diffusivity is kappa, and a lowercase Greek letter, and the time. That is the time of heating. So, for example, if I want to know if I've got fire, it lasts 30 minutes, and a thermal diffusivity of about one millimeter squared per second. Uh, 30 minutes, about 2,000 seconds. Okay, always include units and in calculations so you can see where the cancel seconds cancel. I've got millimeters squared under the square root sign. That's going to give me millimeters out. That's 40 millimeters. It's one significant. Um, now, it might be good to just quick uh, look back at our picture of the spalling boulder, see whether we think that's a reasonable number. It seems way too big, doesn't it? 40 millimeters, not 4 centimeters. Um, doesn't look like we've got anything more than a few millimeters really popping off of that mold. Um, and I don't know how long this heat was applied on this burning log, from that burning log. Um, but the key, the key thing that I told you to remember but didn't write down, and I'll go ahead and write it now, is that we're talking about the depth of significant change. not the depth of change big enough to cause differential stress big enough to crack rock. So we would expect then that the depth of significant change would be potentially substantially larger than the depth, than the thickness of the spalling piece of rock. Yeah? What does kappa signify in the equation? Kappa is the thermal diffusivity. That's a property of the Yeah. Material. Yeah. Does the temperature that the fire is burning have any effect on this equation? Um, not on this equation, no. no. Kind of interesting, right? Yeah. Um, so that means, you know, we could change temperature by one degree for 30 minutes. You know, what's significant? Are we talking like, uh, detecting maybe 10% of that change, something like that. So, um, and again, this is a, you know, I'm not sure that significant is even the right word. I'm trying to remember um, whether this signifies an e-folding depth or an actual significance. So, so we might be talking like, actually more like 30% of the, of the exterior change at that depth. Yeah. Uh, well, so thermal diffusivity has these units of Planck squared for time. Um, ooh, boy, let's see. I'm not sure I'm ready to conceptually explain the units on that number. I can usually do it, but you caught me. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, so it, it does have to do with sort of a, uh, it's like a velocity per width, I think, 
is one way to think of it. But mm. yeah. until your square would be the surface area of the rock, because it's it's a one dimensional thing. It's 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 going into the rock. So we're not talking about a surface area. It, it, It would do that as, as well, but what we're assuming is that we're applying heat uniformly over the whole area, and what we're concerned with is how deeply does it penetrate. So the second dimension there is not, is, you know, it's probably wrong to say velocity per width. Um, it's probably more like a velocity per length in. But again, I wasn't prepared to explain the units on that, on, on that parameter, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll do better next time. <laughs> um, okay. I want to move on, though, to a more difficult and I think uh, somewhat more interesting process um, and talk about frost scratching. So I'm going to go ahead and erase all of this. I see the room. Got that. I mean, that's a nifty formula that will come up again uh, with frost cracking. It will, it, uh, frost cracking in particular, is pretty important um, at some point. So, cross tracking. There's a right explanation and a wrong explanation, and most books supply the wrong one. Uh, one of the reasons I stick with this book is it supplies the right explanation, uh, which I did not know until I started using this book back in 2010 and was quite embarrassed that I'd been teaching the wrong explanation for several years. Um, so, this frost cracking occurs when ice lenses grow within larger pores of the rock, and the rock breaks to accommodate that ice growth. Um, most books will explain this as a consequence of the expansion of water when it freezes. And there are endless YouTube videos purporting this mechanism, but it doesn't work. Nor does it explain the observed sizes of ice lenses and soils, which can get absurdly large in permafrost. You can't explain an ice lens that is a meter wide from ice wedge that's a meter wide and a meter long by the expansion of water when it freezes. You have to pull water to the ice. The ice has to grow. Um, and it also just doesn't work because the pore spaces in a rock are an open system. The water could just escape. Um, if I put a bottle of water in the freezer and fill it up to the very top and leave it uncapped, the water will just spill over when it freezes. If I want to burst the bottle, i got to put the cap on tight. Um, and then it'll take a long time to freeze, too. Um, the right explanation is heave pressure. So let's go through this step by step. Um, so, Different pores, different freezing temperature. Um, so if we're going to have 
have ice lenses that are growing. So ice lenses are, are good. Water in different pores with different sizes has different freezing points. So here we've got the suppression of the freezing point expressed in degrees Celsius and the curvature of the pore space as one over nanometers. And what you see is that the as the pores as, as curvature increases, pore size decreases, and the suppression, the depression of the freezing point increases. So up here, for example, at uh, say 0.25 per nanometer, uh, which would be four nanometers radius, we've got a 10 degree suppression of the freezing point. Suppression, so that makes it go lower. That makes it go lower. So that means freezing point is minus 10 C. Um, now, since we have a range of pore sizes in a rock, that means that um, that ice is going to form in some pores before it forms in others. And in general, that freezing point, when ice starts, first starts to form in pores, is below zero degrees C. Okay. So we're below, you know, freezing point in the absence of of curvature, uh, but the larger pores freeze first. But that means that the water in the surrounding smaller pores is still liquid while that ice is forming. Um, and that's really important. Uh, the, there's this thing called the pre-melted layer. And it has very low pressure. Um, okay, so what is this pre-melted layer? When I've got some ice, there is what we might call a partially frozen fringe. Some of it might be ice, some might be water. It's, I have never found a good diagram that sort of illustrates this because again, it's one of these completely just not, you know, outside of our regular experience kinds of things. Um, it's, it's sort of like, the water is glommed onto the ice, but it's not yet in that crystal structure. Um, so it's not ice, it's not quite water either, it's pre-melted. And that exists down to sort of phase two of ice at minus 20 degrees C. At minus 20 degrees C, that pre-melted layer goes away. Um, but, but there's a certain pressure that you get in that pre-melted layer the colder it gets, the thinner the pre-melted layer gets, and the greater the pressure gradient across that layer gets. Um, and this is, a, this is a graph of, okay, here's my, um, this is, I, I can see why I had this flip before. <laughs> this is the temperature depression, you know, the temperature below, uh, Yeah, temperature below freezing is over here, and the pressure is over here. And uh, so as I get to the lower temperatures, I get to these higher pressures. Um, and that's not the best graph, but it's the best I can find. Um, so that gives us a low pressure and a low pressure gradient. Uh, which is, produces a tension that draws water towards it. It's like a, like a surface tension or a capillary tension, but it's much stronger. Um, this is incidentally the same mechanism that produces potholes. It's the same mechanism that if you've ever driven way up far north and there are the frosty uh, bumps in the road, it's the same mechanism. Um, and that, so that tension um, pulls liquid water towards it. And leads to 
heave pressure, which is presumably what's dropped there. All right. Um, so, so freezing and not rain is what causes potholes? Yes. Well, supposedly. I don't know. I know it does. I don't know if all potholes are produced this way. Um, because it doesn't seem like it gets cold enough from Corvallis to produce potholes by this mechanism. Okay, that, like I said, that pre-melted layer persists down to around 20 degrees C, but uh, the viscosity increases as the water gets colder. And therefore, the hydraulic conductivity decreases because hydraulic conductivity is permeability divided by viscosity. All right, if those are all new words for you, just remember that syrupy water has a harder time moving through rock, okay? Um, and remember, like, you know, if you've ever kept gin in a freezer, how it looks kind of gloopy when you pour it out. It's because it's viscosity, you know, you, you, you've lowered its temperature pretty far, and a lot of that gin is water and the viscosity gets pretty high as you get pretty far below freezing. Um, and so as we go from, say, minus, so this is, again, a minus T scale here. Um, as we go from, say, minus 2 to minus 10, our hydraulic conductivity drops by an order of magnitude. So, you know, that's, a lot. that's, that's kind of a big change. Um, So so the heave pressure is enough to break the rock. I mean it, it will widen the cracks in order to grow the ice. Um, it will push soil up into the air. Hell, you can make ice flowers. Ice itself will grow up into the air. Um, so that's enough to break the rock, um, but you, and you get a sweet spot, say, between that increasing pressure as you get colder and the decreasing conductivity, hydraulic conductivity as you get colder, so that you get a sweet spot, what we call the frost cracking window in the range of say minus 10 to minus 3C. Yeah. Now that's not a super precise range. As you might imagine, it might depend on the pore space, the size of the pores and, and so on. So different materials might have a somewhat different cross cracking window. Um, here's an experimental apparatus designed to measure this phenomenon. Um, and I love this experiment. You've got a, a, a core of sandstone, and you've got a bottom cooling plate that is relatively warm, and a top cooling plate that is much colder. Um, and you've got foam insulation around it, and you've got a water source from the bottom. And you've got microphones up the column. So you can not only listen for cracking rock, but you can, based on the strength of the signal in the four different microphones, triangulate or whatever, to find where that cracking occurred. And so if you've also got thermistors and you know what the temperature is and so on, then you know what temperature those cracks are occurring at. And so here we have a histogram of the number of acoustic emission events, number of crack sounds, um, versus temperature here. 
And we see here that the sweet spot is more like a minus, you know, cold, so minus three, minus four. So maybe a little narrower sweet spot, although we're still getting frost cracking down to around minus eight degrees C. We're actually even getting frost cracking just a little bit up to just below freezing, or just below zero. Um, and we can also look at the crack growth rate versus temperature for two different uh, pore sizes. Um, but that's, I think, maybe less interesting than, uh, than just that. I, I love this experiment. Um, now, I've run out of time, so I'm not going to get to the Mr. 50s, 1950s narrator school of Sun Frosty, even if you know, get a chance to do that next time. Or, uh, if you want to copy down that link, um, you might watch it yourself. It's, uh, because here's the thing, the engineers knew about this in the 50s. I mean, this is, it's sort of frustrating to me that we've been teaching the wrong thing in geomorphology textbooks all these years, when the engineers have been teaching for years what makes toggle. So, oh well. Yeah? No, hydraulic conduct, yeah, hydraulic conductivity is, it emerges from this thing called Darcy's Law that says that the flow rate is proportional to the head gradient. And that constant of proportionality is called the hydraulic conductivity. And it's a, combi it's, it's a combination of material property, which is permeability, and fluid property, which is viscosity. Yeah? Can you put the graphs up on campus? Um, yeah, I can, I can, yeah, I can do that. Although, actually, these graphs are all in the book. Oh, no, 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 I take that back. They're not. Some of them are. I, I'll post them, yeah, no problem.